Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is a movie from 2019 that I didn't really like at all. I think I made a video way back when about Finn in that film where I was really harsh on it. It is, in my humble and probably not all that controversial opinion, the worst Star Wars movie ever made. Years later though, I also realized it's had another impact. One which probably way fewer people care about, but does bother me. How it has completely monopolized the conversation around director J.J. Abrams. Star Wars is such a giant, beloved series, and Rise of Skywalker was such a shockingly incompetent finale to the new trilogy that, in many circles, it seems to be the beginning and the end of the conversation around Abrams now. Now on one level, this is pretty fair, but on another, I find it really boring, especially as someone who has invested far too much time and interest in this guy's career. So this week, I wanted to take a long view of the career of J.J. Abrams that goes beyond his biggest blockbusters. Acknowledging what's gone wrong and why, and ultimately, I want to retain a little bit of hope that he could still create some interesting work in the future. First, I want to say that the digital edition of my comic Binary C is available right now on Amazon and Kindle Unlimited. Check out that link down below and give it a review if you can. It really feels like notable big name directors are, right now, kind of older than they've ever been. As the original mid-budget film has disappeared, it's become harder and harder for younger directors to become household names. Sure, there are some, but still, like Spielberg is 77, Scorsese is 81, James Cameron is turning 70 soon, the director of Furiosa, George Miller, is 79. And it's in this environment that I think it's easy to think of J.J. Abrams as a young director. But Abrams is turning 58 this year. I don't bring this up to disparage him or anything, obviously there's nothing wrong with being 58, but I think it puts his directorial career in a bit of a sad context. Because this is a guy who has been at the very top of the heap in Hollywood since the early 2010s, in a position that most directors could only dream of. And yet, you look at the list of movies he's directed, and it's five giant franchise sequels and Super 8, an ode to Steven Spielberg and 80s kids movies. Now, I do like some of those movies. I'm a bigger fan of Mission Impossible 3 than most Mission Impossible fans I know. I have my issues with Star Trek 2009 as someone who really loves Trek. I made a whole video about it once, but I still enjoy the movie. And Super 8 is charming, and at this point, probably even a bit underrated. And Force Awakens is, I don't know, fine, I guess. But for someone who has had so much pull in the film industry for so long, I think it's fair to look at that list and think, Really? Like, this is all you wanted to make? Nothing more personal? More your own? I mean, just look at his idol. By the time Spielberg was J.J. Abrams' age, he'd stretched his legs pretty far beyond just action blockbusters. He'd already made movies like Schindler's List, Empire of the Sun, AI Artificial Intelligence, and was about to direct Munich. He wasn't just doing movies like Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Spielberg still returns to those large-scale, family-friendly blockbusters occasionally, but he never confined himself to that. And even if he did want to stay in that arena for the long haul, and I would understand that, I do love Indiana Jones, those movies were created by him and George Lucas. It wasn't just doing someone else's vision forever. Say what you will about Zack Snyder, but something like Rebel Moon, for whatever its flaws, is a massive swing. An attempt for Snyder to establish his own mythology and create his own world and characters. Super 8 is the only attempt to do anything like that in Abrams' film work, and to be fair, I think it's a fairly successful one, but it's also really by the numbers. When I look at his film work, I'm pretty let down by Abrams and his seemingly highly calculated aversion to taking on any project that's a risk, something that I think in the long term has really hurt his career. And I know that that's the J.J. Abrams that most are thinking of when they hear his name, but I must say that's just not really the case for me. Television will always be the medium I most associate with Abrams. He had some screenwriting credits on movies like Regarding Henry and Gone Fishing in the 90s, but it's TV where he really made his name. 
J.J. Abrams would eventually become known for his use of lens flare and his mystery box approach to storytelling, the latter of which he really actively fostered with things like his TED Talk and his strange 2013 book experience, S. But you wouldn't know that by looking at his first show, Felicity, which premiered in the fall of 1998 on the WB. And honestly, though Felicity is far from perfect, I think Abrams would benefit from returning to its far more grounded storytelling at some point down the line. Starring Carrie Russell, who he'd later work with again in Mission Impossible 3, and co-created by Matt Reeves, who would go on to direct The Batman, Felicity is, for most of its run, about as far from the bombast of their future projects as you can get. On a surface level, it's really hard to see much of any connection between this coming-of-age, college-set show and his later work, but I do think it's very much there. The show centers on Felicity Porter, a teen who moves across the country to attend a very NYU-like college in New York City. There's the guy she has a crush on when she moves there, Ben, played by Scott Speedman, and her dorm RA, Noel, played by Scott Foley. Soon, a love triangle develops, all while Felicity deals with the trials and tribulations of being new to college and to the city. If this all sounds incredibly basic, well that's because it is. For much of its run, Felicity is a very grounded show. If you grew up on, like, Euphoria, this version of the teen drama may feel completely foreign to you. It's incredibly earnest, incredibly 90s, bathed in the warm glow of gauzy cinematography and wall-to-wall -wall soft rock, with yearning and heartbreak set appropriately to Sarah McLachlan songs about love. And if that all sounds boring to you, I'm gonna be honest. It probably will be. And yet, I find a lot to like in Felicity. It's small stakes, it's nuanced lead performances, and it's often very effective writing. And it's in Felicity where we find the first real example of the type of J.J. Abrams lead he would go back to again and again. The quiet, introverted young woman trying to find her way in the world. Now one of the stranger aspects of Felicity is in its final season, which baffled audiences at the time and gave a clear indication of where Abrams' interests would lie in the future. In the final batch of episodes, Felicity becomes something of a magical time travel show, with our lead seeing how her choices play out in multiple timelines. It's a really odd ending for this show, but it makes perfect sense in the context of the kinds of storytelling that would go on to define Abrams later. Alias, his spy show from 2001 starring Jennifer Garner, was a minor hit for a few seasons, and eventually led to his gig on Mission Impossible, as Tom Cruise was apparently very impressed with what he saw. Now these days, in the age of extremely bloated streaming TV budgets, Alias may look a bit cheap, but for 2000's network TV, it was very noted for being cinematic and slick. It takes a lot of what worked in Felicity, the heartbreak, the lead having to navigate her love life and her dreams, the sad montages set to Sarah McLaughlin, but added in a heavy dose of espionage action and, crucially, a mystery box supernatural mythology, which weaved its way through the narrative of the show. And here's where we get to a very controversial element of Abrams' career. He sets things up well and is generally not very good at taking them anywhere. Lost is often cited as an example of this, but in that case, it's just not true as Abrams was never the showrunner. But they've kind of got him dead to rights on Alias. The Rambaldi mysteries in Alias, which involve these ancient and mystical artifacts the show often uses as MacGuffins, never adds up to much of anything, and mostly serves as an easy way for Abrams and company to push the supernatural heightened stories into where he wants the audience headspace to be for these emotionally charged moments, with no real care for their greater significance in the long term. It's really effective at times, providing the series with some very high highs. But the longer it runs, the more you get that Wizard of Oz sense, where there's a lot of smoke and mirrors to cover for any real lack of a point to this mythology, or definitely any sense of how to wrap it up. Now, I think this is fairly forgivable for a show like Alias, to be honest, where that stuff mostly just served to facilitate interesting twists and turns for the characters' relationships. It's a bigger issue when it becomes THE thing Abram starts hanging his hat on. Still, I do like Alias, and I love the pilot of Lost, which he directed. In the case of Lost, I think showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse were able to piece together a mythology and world that's incredibly emotionally engaging, thematically rich and complex, and fairly satisfying in the end. I know many would disagree, and yes, it is all pretty convoluted. 
But I don't think there's nearly as many unanswered questions as its detractors like to claim, and the conversations around its finale tend to simplify the episode in ways that kind of drive me nuts, to be honest. Maybe someday I'll talk about that at length, but it's not really relevant here because Abrams was just not the one making the decisions at that point. He simultaneously gets too much credit and too much blame for Lost. In many ways, it's the ideal J.J. Abrams project, something he can start off on a really good foot and then leave before he has to figure out what to do with any of the pieces that he put on the board. Still, I think you can see some of the personal touches of Abrams in those early episodes. Early on in production, the character of Jack was supposed to die in the pilot, with Kate taking on a more central role than she ultimately ended up playing. You can see traces of that in the very Kate-heavy pilot, and she's a classic Abrams lead, highly internal and conflicted, like Sidney Bristow and Felicity Porter before her. But all of Abrams' worst tendencies, the empty mystery box storytelling, and the reliance on these big moments to carry emotional weight that don't really hold up to scrutiny after the fact, seem to only be encouraged by big blockbuster filmmaking. While many of the things that I did like about him, the dorky earnestness, the grounded relationships, and the exploration of fairly repressed people, faded into the background, leaving us with a filmmaker it's hard to feel too passionate about either way. So what would I like to see from Abrams? Well, definitely not this Hot Wheels brand movie that he's been attached to, but thankfully that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. What I'd really like to see is him return to TV. This will probably seem really out of left field, but there was a show on HBO from like 2017 to 2020 called Room 104 that never garnered much attention. It was from the Duplass brothers, and its premise was really simple. Every episode was set in the same rundown motel room. Some episodes it would be this like small scale character piece or relationship drama, other times it would be a strange Twilight Zone-esque genre show. It was wildly uneven, but I thought the great episodes were something special. I'd really love to see something like that from J.J. Abrams, something that lets him tell these intimate relationship stories, alongside some weirder episodes that indulge his mystery box instincts. Whatever it is though, I do want to see it on a smaller scale, something that's less reliant on flash and bombast. I'd just really like to see if J.J. Abrams can still do that, and if the results would give us anything that's better and more interesting than The Rise of Skywalker. Learning can be hard, but continuing to learn is so important. That's why Brilliant exists. It's a service I'd highly recommend to anyone looking to pick up new skills and keep their mind sharp. For years now, Brilliant has been making the process of learning way more fun and accessible than ever before. It helps you tackle math, science, and computer science concepts in a highly interactive way, and it also allows you to do it entirely on your schedule. Classes that can perfectly fit into your life instead of having to plan your entire week around them. And there are thousands of lessons on here, with new ones being added constantly. Spending just 30 minutes a day or so on them is both fun and builds your skills without any of the stress that you might remember associating with these topics. I'd check out Thinking in Code, Creative Coding Programming with Python. These lessons get you familiar with Python and let you start building programs on day one with a built-in drag and drop editor, where you'll learn essential coding elements, again, all at your own pace. So try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash midnight or clicking on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. That's brilliant.org slash midnight. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started, because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.